So let me keep going. So I have another example, um, which I wanted to illustrate in a slightly different aspect of the issue. Um, um, but, but before I get to that example, I, I want to kind of follow up a question from earlier. Um, so, you know, I think that um, if you look at data visualization as a research team in academia, um, there are two particular directions that they need to be pushing. One is sort of uh, conversations around visual representation. So you, you, you talk about the colors, you talk about um, different types of data, different types of uh, um, network diagrams, and you talk about interactivity and, and that sort of thing. And then also there's a lot of focus on rules of thumb. So, you know, don't use pie charts, you know, uh, network class, uh, you know, a column class that is not a zero, um, and that sort of thing. So the idea of these rules of thumb is that somehow the whole team can be uh, organized in a very scientific way. If I give you some flow charts, then everyone following the flow charts will give you the same, you know, perfect chart that will give you the right answer. Um, that's a very math science engineering type of way of thinking about things. Um, what I've learned over the years is really that is not enough. I don't think that um, that level of objectivity is a uh, direction that is uh, possible. So let me give you a few examples of what I mean by that. So here is a perfectly fine chart if you were to follow the N plus B type rules, you know, not too many aggressively clear what's going on. Um, you know, this was sort of the last election where Hillary had a 65% favorable rating, 29% unfavorable, all the way down the line. Um, you know, it's not, not uh, it's not a shocking chart, but it's also not bad. Um, so I would say this chart answers an important question around the election time, and it has a very standard form. So there's nothing to complain about there, but there's something wrong with this chart. So if you look carefully, um, you'll find that Tea Party and John Burnett is different. So John Burnett's rating was 20 to 52. So there's 48% not on the this chart. Uh, tea Party, 37 to 41, there's 78. So there's a big chunk that's not represented here. But it seems like everyone has an opinion of Hillary, um, you know, 84%, 94% uh, is on there, and so on. So um, if you are, Looking at favorable and favorable ratings, and you notice that people like Tea, tea Party and John Burnett uh, there are lots of people undecided. That's sort of where the story of the data is, right? That these people were straight either way, and you know we don't really know uh, at this point uh, how these people fare. Um, so what this is illustrating is that even if your visual is fine, your chart gets really bad. In this particular case, I think the way that it handles missing data, which is basically ignored, um, kind of like a Syria chart, um, is uh, not good. Um, this was a very famous, it came out in 2010, I think. Um, it was in Wired Magazine. This was uh, responding to the open data, public data type thing. So New York City published all of the 301 call data, um, which basically grouped these calls into different uh, complaints. Um, so what am I doing to this job? Well, um, people don't complain when they're sleeping. What else is going on? Well, the street lights, the, the light blue patch. Well, um, when the street lights are on during the day, you get more complaints, I guess, is what it's saying. Um, you have noise, right? People don't like noise when they're sleeping. Um, so, you know, my big problem here is I really don't understand the purpose of this chart. So I would say the project makes use of big data over data is a good thing. Uh, a lot of people react to this visual form and really like it. I haven't seen it, but you know, I'm just here in the past just because uh, I'm not bowing to the average. Um, this is the street graph format. And then, but my big problem here is I don't understand uh, what is the point, right? There's got to be a reason. Um, in fact, I mean, some of my former students have actually used this data set for their projects, 
And you can do a lot more if you would with this focus on only one particular region of the country, uh, of, the, of, the, of the city, or focus on particular types of uh, complaints. But in almost all cases, going back to the question before, you really need to pull in all this data to kind of bring color into the message. Um, to answer any kind of real question that, that, that uh, we have. Um, this one is the New York Times project called Earth in Texas. So on the y-axis is uh, how happy uh, people are in different countries. On the x-axis is the tax system, how aggressive it is against the white side, the people on the left side, you can pay less. And there are 54 nations, uh, 54 stops in this map. So, um, this scale so I have to say, um, the first thing, my first reaction is, wow, these people are, 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 are professionals uh, because if you've ever tried to make a scale plot of 54 stops with 54 labels, uh, you will know that it would be basically a mess that you cannot get stuff out of. But it seems like this chart is pretty readable, so that's a really good thing that they've done. Um, I mean, the way that they've done this is by you know, colors, by making four quadrants by really good labeling of the axes, you know, I mean, there's lots of things that are done to make this beautiful. Um, so, you know, what do I think about this chart? Well, I love the way they executed the, um, uh, the chart itself. It also raises, uh, raises an engaging question, right? So who doesn't want to know if I pay less taxes if I'm going to tax or not? Um, but I have a big problem with this day, way that the data uh, is used and analyzed. So if you look at the subcategory there, apparently the conclusion is that more progressive tax rates have happier citizens on average. Well, I mean, if I look at the scale of points, I see a cloud. I see dots everywhere in, on this page. So um, I don't really understand how they came to the conclusion that there's a positive correlation um, but that's not even the biggest problem. The bigger problem is as follows. Um, by making this chart, you know, this goes back to the question from the gentleman over there. By making this chart where you're basically uh, correlating happiness with tax and you're not controlling for any other factor, you're basically telling people that everything, the only thing that affects people's happiness is the amount of tax. So if you're forcing an answer because you're doing a very bad analysis. <laughs> um, I don't even want to get into why every 54 stops is there's over 200 countries and how those stops were chosen. Um, in addition to the fact that um, are we really then trusting uh, the measure of happiness, which comes from essentially these happiness surveys, uh, in addition to the fact that um, on the on the x-axis there, there's a definition of progressiveness, which is the top minus the bottom uh, tax rate, which I'm not sure, and you know, maybe I feel like there must be other more sophisticated ways that look at most points of the distribution of uh, the income curve as opposed to just the bottom, you know, the statistician taking the bit and the max and using that as a representation of the whole distribution seems to be quite foolish. So anyway, there are a gazillion problems I have with this analysis. So again, even though by traditional standards this chart would be perfect because it's so, so great from an efficient representation perspective, this data visualization project to me is also a baby. So, um, so if I try to summarize how I view data visualization, there are really three um, really important questions that I'm always thinking about. How is this trifecta checkup? It's a sort of a summary of my approach to doing uh, data visualization for me. Um, but you can also use it to help conceptualize the project. So the most important thing is up there at the top, which is what is the purpose of this data visualization? What is the practical question you're trying to solve? Is there a decision related to this uh, chart? Um, and then, of course, once you have that, then you want to also be clear on what is the message you want to send to the audience. Um, the next part is, what does this data say? Um, what is, uh, do you have to write data to answer that question that is now clearly defined, or are you just pulling in whatever data you can find? 
you know, even like for instance, if, for instance, the whole Spotify thing before you can get talk about before. Well, you know, who's to say that Spotify is going to be the most intelligent of anything? Um, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but you know, you have to make an argument for why it's the most intelligent. Um, is there anything in the data that needs to be fixed? Are there missing values? Are there incorrect values? Um, and also, how do you process the data? Um, you know, like I showed you earlier today, um, there are ways to process the data that highlights your, the answer to your question. There are other ways to process your data that brings in all kinds of noise that distracts your question. So you can see that the green arrow there is basically saying that it's not just the two separate questions, but also whether the question and the data are in sync with each other. Um, then the last corner is the visual corner, which is the traditional research kind of I put it all in that bucket. Um, it's that given the question you're asking, the message you're delivering, and the data that you have to deliver the message, um, are you thinking the right platform, colors, interactivity, dynamic nature, you know, all that stuff. Um, and again, they need, the visual needs to work on its own, but more importantly, is it the right visual to make your child scream the answer to your question? Um, is it the right visual to uh, in sync with the data or the nature of the data, the data type that you, um, you have, uh, you're using? So, you know, what happens is in any data visualization project, I'm uh, kind of circling around this few, three, three, you know, three quarters, um, because, you know, you might have good questions, but you might not be able to get the data. So if you have some unrelated data, then you might need to change your question in order to make it sharp, or at least to make it sync. And the same thing with visual versus the data, the visual versus the question. So it's always kind of like this sort of um, just moving around. So um, that's a long way to get to my uh, case study. Uh, which comes from this chart that Washington Post published last year uh, with this really new age kind of uh, over-aggressive uh, headline and that this chart explains everything you need to know about inequality. So the one thing I know from this statement is that this chart does not explain <laughs> everything you need to know. One chart can never explain uh, everything you need to know. Um, so, uh, so this is the chart that they published. Um, so basically, in, they have average income for the top 1% at the bottom, uh, average income for the bottom 90% uh, of the vertical axes, and so each uh, stop is a year of data, and what you can see is that um, in the initial, so they also have this color scheme for cars running uh, from left to right, so it turns out that in uh, this particular case, the time dimension happens to work in sync with the where the data is going. So if you look left to right on the chart, it's essentially time to report. So roughly speaking, what happens is uh, in the initial part <coughs> before 1980, it turns out uh, the numbers are kind of moving upwards, which means that the average income for the top one percent is not moving as much. Uh, relative to how much the bottom line is improving, so the inequality is improving. Then, um, as you go beyond 1980, which is the, uh, the, where the numbers go uh, move to the right, uh, this is where the top percent is really increasing uh, their income a lot uh, compared to the standard series of the bottom line percent. So that's sort of really the, the, this chart. Um, so it turns out that the Washington Post chart is an adaptation of something that I first showed up in um, NPR. Um, so this was the interactive chart that I was showing, it's essentially the same thing. The NPR one is actually slightly better, in my view. Um, it has um, a few things. One is that it's clearly labeled. So again, it goes back to making it easy for the uh, reader. So, the up arrow says between 1930, 1930 and 1970, only the bottom 90% saw their income rise. And then on the top, it gives you what happens on the, uh, when it goes to the right. So you don't have to even really read anything about to really, uh, you know, you, those, those text pages were really guided to how people read the chart. 
Um, the other thing that they've done um, is that they use three colors uh, to, so you can see that there's yellow, uh, green, and red. So the yellow dots is the traditional um, uh, sadness of the years in which the income inequality metric has been changed in terms of the size of the, the small range. So you could argue that that may be distracting, that may not be distracting uh, to your message, but essentially uh, that's an extra level of detail that was in the So, um, so this chart is by no means a bad chart again, right? I mean, I actually would have given this as the trifactor of the deal. This is actually, according to my three quarter um, analysis, this is actually a, a, a very good chart. Um, because this chart delivers a, an incisive commentary of a hot button political issue and the reason to question underlying it, uh, utilizing a direct and simple visual design, and very importantly, an intelligent selection of data from the latest economic research. So, um, a lot of the secret of this chart is the fact that they take those two metrics, the, the top 1% and the bottom 1%. You know, if you look at the data that we have available on income inequality, there are tons and tons of data there. Um, you can put a lot more data into these charts than, than those two, but it turns out that those two are pretty key to, uh, to describing this message. Now, um, like I said at the beginning, uh, if, you are, if, you, if you are a professional, you have that mentality, you're a professionalist, even good charts can be improved. So I'm going to show you uh, what I'm going to do with these charts. So the first thing I needed to do is to make a version. Uh, so this would be something that I'm going to replicate now. Um, so this is a jump view chart, so this is trying to replicate what, um, what was uh, in, uh, on the other two. So let me close. So I'm now going to quality. Um, okay, so this one doesn't really require any uh, processing. So literally, I have the years, I have top of percent, bottom of nine percent. So I can go about doing my chart right away. Put those here and here. I don't want any lines, so I'm going to do that. Um, so now I'm going to start doing these things where I want to make an Amazon, come up on me, make it easier. So one thing that I'm going to need to do here is to color and label these dots. So um, this is a dot plot. I mean, I would prefer not to label every single dot with the four numerals um, because it gets really clustered. So what I'm going to try to do is to color these dots, but also only label every five of these um, to make it less. So the other thing that you notice is that uh, because of that very ordering thing on the bottom right, so I'm going to add a very ordering to move the three to the close. So these are all associated with the columns, so I only need to change this one. So if 
I go back here, she brings all the things, so I can include it in my color coding scheme. So you can't really tell what you work because these are now circles, these are now green. Um, adding a background color would help. Okay. How about like that? Um, so uh, I made these dots really small because I wanted to apply gear labels to this. So the next one I want to do is apply gear labels. I want to do this every five years. So I'm going to create a column that basically is called gear labels. And you can view that with a formula. I mean, there are many ways to do this, but that's just with a formula. So there's actually a module function. Um, very handy. So all this is saying is if the year is divisible by five, then I'm going to uh, keep the year label. And if it's not, I'm going to leave it blank. So this is going to be my label. So what I need to do is now tell Chunk what to label. So I'm going to take all the no labeled ones, and then I'm going to invert this uh, to the other ones. So these are the ones that I want to label. So I'm going to go here and label the row. But then I'm going to need to go here to label the column. And we do that here to label the column. Um, you can move these around if you like, but I'm not going to bother with that right now. Um, you know, you can, like I said, if you spend three times as much time as you probably do making these stops, it will look better. Um, you can also be very uh, specific and say, oh, I want an extra, uh, and I don't want this good line to show up, so they do stuff like that. Um, and I want it to be lines to be very uh, subtle, so you can't really see the negative part. Um, so, so uh, and then I want to change this to income inequality exposure uh, sales tax. Um, okay. So uh, I also want to hide my methods. Okay, so this would be uh, the starting point. So this is sort of me trying to replicate what's So, um, this, this is sort of that. Um, now, there's something that's important to do in this one. This guy, which um, has to do with the fact that when the line is moving up, the inequality is decreasing, and when the line is moving sideways, the inequality is increasing. Doesn't seem to be a natural way of presenting this. In fact, it reminds me of that chart, right? Um, it seems to me that if the inequality is exploding, it should be going up. And if the inequality is not changing, it should be going sideways. So um, this could easily be fixed because you could know, literally turn this, the, the axis around, or this formula. So now, on this particular chart, um, if, since I have automatic set here, um, this goes sideways quality is exploding, it actually is up. It makes more sense. So um, a sketching tool is amazing in this sort of uh, in the way you need this because what happens is all I needed to do here is to say swap that. Right? So if you try to do this in Excel, which I'm sure some of you have, none of the settings will work. You have to go back and label and do everything. Again, but here it's just like you know, done this and stuff like this. Uh, so that's 1980, so that's where things start moving up. Now, um, there's some other thing here that is not good. Um, did anyone look at the scales of these things? Um, so it turns out that down here, you know, on the 90%, um, each kind of label is only. The, the space between the two labels is five thousand dollars. On the vertical axis, the space between two labels is like two hundred thousand dollars. So even if this whole thing is right, it is still wrong because it gives the wrong understanding of the 
the amount of change. So every vertical change here is a much larger scale. It's basically uh, compressed compared to the horizontal rule. So this is where I have to break another rule that the uh, research people like to say. Right? So this is really a, a scatter plot. And research people like to say, when you have two data sets looking at correlation, you have to do a scatter plot. No, no, to plot two time series lines on top of each other. This is really how to tell what's going on. Um, but you know what? Um, if you have two time series lines like this, then your plots have one scale because time is the other scale. So that's what I'm going to do here: is to basically move this into here, and I'm going to move here and here, and then I'm going to change this. So this version, um, I mean, I, I really need to um, apply labels, but this version is like down below is the change over time of the bottom line percent, and the uh, version, uh, the line above is the change over time of the top one percent. Uh, so what you can see here, because both numbers are on the same scale, you know, the the magnitude of this gap increasing, right? the gap is really the gap between the two lines, um, is really big. Kind of see that um, it is sort of increasing even in the green period, but it is in the purple period that things really uh, go out of way. Um, you can put, you know, just to make the 1980 watershed clear, you can put a reference line here. So, take that. I mean, you can make it as far as you want, um, but you can kind of see. So um, going back to here, so um, properly labeled, the thing is now going to look like this. Um, so here's the interface. Now then, um, well that's not the last sketch that I've made, because like, okay, that's pretty good, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but then I'm, I keep thinking to do you know, this is still with five people to see some math in the head because if they really want to know the income gap, they need to compute it themselves. So, and I make this even easier. Uh, so one idea may be to express this, uh, turn the two, two lines to one. You know, do the calculations on behalf of the agreements, which is something that I'd love to do. Um, and you should too, because uh, I think there's a trend towards uh, outsourcing work to readers. So, um, so I want to calculate a, uh, I want to calculate a ratio of uh, bottom line percent to top line percent. So, you know, this. so there are many ways to do this again, but um, I can do this on the fly by um, basically saying I want to create a formula. Um, this one percent divided by bottom line percent, and here I can. So now um, I want to uh, plot this guy here. So I'm not finding the right place, so I'm going to have to move the other two like that. Wow, this is actually really telling. Um, so what this is saying is that uh, in the 1930s, we hit the high that the top 1% is actually doing like 30, uh, 30%, uh, 33 times the income of the bottom 9%. And then we went through a period where inequality really improved a lot. Um, and it reaches a low in the 1970s. But from 1980 on, things have gotten progressively